Okay, hello and welcome to my talk about the extended 2FS file system implementation in FreeBSD. Um, this file system is not really that important for us in FreeBSD, but it's, it has a special value for me because this was the means that I used to become a committer in FreeBSD. Basically, the, the file system was not very well uh, it implemented. It, it was rotten in the tree, but basically, and nobody wanted to use it because it's under the GPL. So it, it never saw much use in FreeBSD. Um, it even started, uh, we even started removing features from it. And, and meanwhile, there was an, imp an implementation in NetBSD and people can use their X2 file systems from Windows. So it was sort of interesting to see something happening to it. Uh, and well, I've been using FreeBSD since about 20 years. I did like a huge amount of ports and I mean, the history in the, in the PR database that I have is quite, quite impressive but I never was really invited to become a ports committer back then. And only when I started working intensely on this did I become a committer. And well, after that I've been doing a lot of things on, on other parts of the system. And some of them not, not very easy to do, but th this was the, the, the thing that got me started. And that's usually the story with many FreeBSD developers. You just need some part of the tree where you can hang and you can start doing things, and, and then you will find a lot of more lot, uh, a lot of more uh, nice things to do in the system. Okay, so why is X2FS so important? Something very weird in Linux. The the one thing that identifies Linux, the one technology that they have developed pretty much from the start, is the X2FS file system. It's still the fastest file system in, free, in, in Linux. And they even have this mentality that is not, not probably what, ju what you would expect in a normal Unix file system is that uh, if all their file systems do the normal stuff, if all their systems do their homework, then the fastest file system is simply the better, right? The best of them. Um, we will pretty much discuss that, that way of thinking here, but uh, well, from the performance point of view, I found a very recent uh, performance benchmark of all their file systems. And it appeared that in 2010, at least, the, files, the fastest file system in Linux is still X2. Um, in Linux, X2, X3, and X4 are actually different file systems. In FreeBSD, we have done it so that uh, we build upon Extended 2, and, and then we add features from Extended 3 and Extended 4. So for what for us is extended two file system is also extended three and extended four, uh, but for them it is a completely different file system. Um, okay, extended four, the journal, journaling file system from IBM and XFS, they all have similar performance. Uh, extended four is a little bit faster. Um, one thing is, as soon as extended three added the journaling, the performance went really low. They, they completely lost performance adding the journal. There are some nice things out about the way Extended 3 indeed uses the journal. They do some sort of delayed allocation in the journal. And XFS has learned from that recently and because XFS was even slower than X3FS. Uh, ButterFS in the time in 2010 was actually the slowest file system of, the, of all the implementations in Linux. Another interesting thing about uh, the X2FS, it is available, of course, in Linux. There is support to Windows. Uh, the main BSDs have it. All the BSDs have it. There is, an, uh, Max o, there is a Max OS, OS X implementation. Sorry. Um, it is based on the FreeBSD version, right? It broke recently because Apple has been removing uh, support for, for some of the support required for external file systems, but, uh, but basically it was based on the FreeBSD implementation when it was done. Aiku also has an X2FS implementation. When, when, the, X2, uh, when the X2FS was created, there, was, there were also ports for HERD and MASIX. MASIX, I don't know, it simply disappeared from the net. It's not, it was a research operating, operating I mean, it was a research operating system in France, but it appears to not be used anymore. 
and there is also an OS2 driver. So you can find X2FS on basically every file system that you know around, and it does have some Unix-like features that uh, a normal FAT file system doesn't have. It has soft links, for example, and it uh, accepts very well long names, and it, it is case sensitive. So it is still very useful as a, as, as a file system. You can carry in a memory stick in that, that you want to interoperate on many operating systems, and it, it has some, some Unix-like features that you want. Um, until not long ago, it was, uh, uh, the X2 was sort of recommended for SSDs, because since it doesn't do journaling, uh, X3 is the one that does journaling, uh, it doesn't wear so much the SSDs as, as would uh, an X3 or X4 file system using uh, journaling. Um, it, is com it is considered lightweight, since they basically froze extended two and went to move to extended three and then to extended four, they try to keep X2 very simple. And that's actually a very interesting advantage because you can experiment adding new features to it without, without adding more complexity and see if these things would work in other file systems. But it also has some academic value. Uh, it has become very useful for papers and for research for that same reason. Okay, I'll just go a little overview of how this came to be, in, at least in FreeBSD. Um, in 1992, there was an initial implementation of the X2 file system in Linux. It is based on the concepts seen in UFS, but as we will see uh, just in a while, it, the idea was to replace the, the existing Minix-like file system that the, the first versions of Linux were using. Uh, in 1995, so basically three years afterwards, there was an initial port of the GNU extended to file system um, in FreeBSD. In 1998, NetBSD rewrote X2FS. They based on, on our UFS, actually on their UFS, and they created a, a stripped down version of UFS that basically read and write X2FS. It was interesting. So you see a nice hole here. The idea is that for 10 years, no one really cared about X2FS in FreeBSD. Uh, and that no one cares means that features rotted. Um, and really, no one cared. Uh, in 2009, I actually proposed it as a, as, a, as a project idea once. Actually, I, I, I don't know, it was in 2005, I, I really forgot. Someone should do something about it and merge probably the NetBSD and the FreeBSD free ports. That, that I thought that, but no one did it. Okay, in 2009, 2010, 2012, we started getting Google Summer of Code project related to X2FS. And one of the ideas was it would be really nice to have a file system where students could experiment to do all their toys of their toy projects and see what happens, right? Because we didn't really have, I mean, you cannot have people playing with UFS, which is the main file system used in FreeBSD, right? And, and well, and porting a completely new file system is not something that people want to do, so it would be nice to have somewhere where people can experiment and students are just fine with that. Okay. Okay, I'll start a little bit with a history of of Linux, as I said, it was based on, on UFS. The idea is, uh, just like in UFS, it is, uh, the file system is defined by its super block and its inode structures. We have that in headers, you can find it in, uh, well that's, that's two, X3 and X4 uh, pages have a, a wiki site. You can check all their structures there, that's public information. So, uh, and basically, they have the control of that design and, and if you follow the super block and the inode structures, you should be able to reproduce what X2FS does. One thing that is rather interesting, and it's pretty much noticed in the, noted in the literature, um, like they started implementing the idea behind UFS, and at some point they said, well, this works, this basically works without adding a lot of the stuff that UFS does. In particular, the older UFS uses the geometry of the disk to try to synchronize the information how it is written. Uh, um, and that, that was 
that was actually useful for performance like long years ago, right? But the disks evolved and that information now is mostly hidden or, or irrelevant and so uh, Linux didn't go into that, of course. Uh, even UFS doesn't really carry that information anymore. Uh, the modern UFS, they didn't go into that and they also didn't implement fragments. Um, let's see what happens. You start with a block size in your file system and after some time you notice, or the UFS guys know, noted pretty easily that if you make bigger block sizes, uh, the, the performance would improve because you were able to write uh, more information in less time, so performance would improve. Uh, but growing the block sizes has this disadvantage that you lose a lot of, inf of information, right? Because if your information is less than the block size and you are writing a complete block and you don't know how to, uh, if you don't have any granularity there, that space you will, be, will basically be lost. So exactly that's what happens in X2FS. They have uh, small block sizes. They don't grow the block sizes because if they grow the block sizes, they might lose more space. Uh, but ju just using simple blocks without getting into managing fragments uh, is, is rather simpler and it seems to work very well with normal, their normal performance expectations. Extended 3 was released on 1999. The idea was is basically that it, that's journaling. It's not optional. If you have a journal, then you have extended three. If you don't have a journal, then it, it's extended two. And that's basically everything that was added in extended three. Uh, the idea, there's also there a difference between FreeBSD and Linux in conception that um, FreeBSD trans, tries to run everything or, or try to run, uh, to run everything in uh, sync mode. Linux says, it's under the, philosoph under the philosophy that well, sooner or later, things may go wrong. It's just better to have a better FSEK tool that will catch all the errors and, and leave the, uh, the disk to do better performance. So they actually run in a sync mode and they don't even have a sync mode that works. Um, and then after some time they discovered that, well, a sync mode is not really that safe. We need something like journaling. They added journaling. On extended four, it was released in 2008 and probably you, most of you remember how the process of that went. Basically added extents so that they would get better performance. Um, journaling, journaling was, was kept, but they made it optional. And uh, so, well, if you want to know if you're, ex if you're using extended four or not, then you, you must have extents. Otherwise you're using extended three or extended two. After this, well, the design has just shown its, its limits. The idea by the extended four designers uh, and the developers in involved is that the future is ButterFS. And ButterFS is pretty much somewhat like their answer to ZFS. The idea is copy and write. Uh, and another thing that they, they have is ButterFS, you, you can convert your extended two or extended three or extended four. Uh, partitions to ButterFS uh, transparently. That's another reason why we really needed to have a good extended two, three, and four implementation in FreeBSD. Because if you want to the penguinize your system, you basically have to read the information that is on those old partitions. Uh, you can probably manage around doing a tar of all the file system, but well, for a huge file system that is rather problematic. It's, really much better to be able to put your disk online and copy it to a C CFS uh, partition and, and continue working. And of course, the, the license for the Linux kernel is G JPL ver version two. So that's the license there. Okay. Now, the BSD light sports that was in 1995, Godmar back, did this for match. Uh, there was a subset of the BSD uh, code that was ported to Match that was called Match Lite. And they basically had two approaches to try to port. They, they were also interested in, in porting and having an X2FS. So they had two approaches. The first approach was take complete the Linux code and port it to the Match kernel. 
that was uh, terribly difficult according to Godmar. They basically failed. And basically because the interfaces are completely different. So the, the VFS differences and completely different buffer cache and also the directory stuff, it was, it wasn't feasible to maintain that port. So their second, port, second approach was take UFS. They actually use UFS in, in match. Uh, and try to put the minimal, the minimal part, of, well not really the minimal, take all the block allocation code from Linux and, and glue it into, the U, into UFS. And that worked. Uh, they, uh, when you look at the code, you see some, some mentions that they are mimicking what they are doing in Linux using the same BSD functions. But that, that strange mixture works. Some Linux specifics were not ported. Um, and then also, of course, some of the UFS specifics were not really meant to work along with the Linux code, so they were removed or not implemented. Uh, the clustered writes. Clustered writes is a technology that was meant to be like, uh, to give some of the performance advantages in extents into UFS. That, that was developed by Sun, and well, that was left out. And there was, a, an, there was an if def fancy realloc. Uh, it was also not implemented. It was, it looked very difficult to implement on, on UFS. It was left like mentioned in the notes, but it was not done. Of course, the license was GPL version two and BSD license, the part that came from UFS because it was based on the, on the BSD code. Okay. For FreeBSD 2.2, John Dyson, which was a very well known developer, he, he did a huge revamp of the virtual memory stuff. He uh, got in contact, in contact with, uh, with uh, match UFS people and he took that code and he basically ported it to FreeBSD. Okay, the port had a lot of problems. It is notably slower than the Linux version, um, but it worked, sort of. There were many bug reports in the first the first versions, but it worked. Okay, NetBSD took that same code, that same code, and ported it for a while, and after that, after some time, it simply was not working very well. Um, okay, so we basically had a file system that worked everywhere. Um, eventually, well, since the licenses BSD plus GPL, it, it was not really very interesting for free BSD developers to work on it. There was no effort to keep in sync with upstream Linux in, in doing this. Eventually, when the journaling was, was implemented in Linux, we decided to remove the MKFS and FSEK utilities from our user and code because it was, uh, well, if these tools uh, found the journal, they would probably just break it, break the file system. It, so that was unacceptable. Um, I think, stopped working, I don't know really why, but no one cared about fixing it, so it was simply removed. Um, and uh, of course, we will see a little bit more about that later. Uh, it's GPL code, so it had to be isolated from the rest of the kernel. It cannot live along with UFS. Uh, it was a KLD, it was not compiled into the kernel. Okay, NetBSD, the idea was if this is really so similar to UFS, we can just take UFS, copy it somewhere, and replace all the headers, and, and then see how it goes from there. They did that, and it worked. And that was, well, rather surprising. And I think it, it was done like in two weeks. Afterwards, they added some of the newer features, but uh, they basically re-implemented <coughs> everything. They did copy some part from the FreeBSD code, because I was just walking around the, the code and I saw, oh look, they did this and this and this. One of the parts that it's very different between UFS and, and Linux is the directory, the, the directory lookup code. Okay, as I said, the implementation is very clean. That's something interesting because if you take the, the BSD, the FreeBSD implementation, and you look at it, it has gone through like two or three operating systems before getting back into FreeBSD, so it's a mess. And it has code that is on, on GNU style and code that is on FreeBSD style. The headers are from Linux. It was a complete 
a complete mess from, from a style point of view. It was uh, well, diff difficult to manage, difficult to understand where it came from. And one thing that is very clear is the implementation was slower than the FreeBSD port. Okay. Now, and remember, this is 10 years afterwards, okay? The FreeBSD file system was basically very rotten. Uh, there was a first Google Summer of Code with the idea of making it GPL free. I mean, if, if it were GPL free, then that means we can start using it a lot more. That means developers will be more friendly with it. Uh, that means we can load it by default. It was important to have a GPL free, but even then by the quality standards in FreeBSD, even if it were GPL free, it also had to, to prove some performance. Otherwise, uh, people say, well, we are not really here doing this because of, of license issues. We are not GPL sealets. We, well, we are not BSD sealets. So we want, we, we want to keep the, the, the GPL license because it's not really doing any problem for anyone. So, well, okay, the mentor was Lulf at FreeBSD. Um, and the idea was, well, where should you start, right? If you're going to do this, where should you start? Should you start from NetBSD code, which is mostly clean out there and you don't really have to worry about the licensing of each file? Or would you start from the FreeBSD part, which is already working? It's, it's not an easy decision, but well, oh, and should you start by looking at the, at the algorithms or by looking at the headers? I think that, well, the headers are just m renaming some lice, some some variables. Maybe maybe it's easier to start with the code. Who knows? Well, coders are lazy, so we started what was was, was working right there, and we basically uh, break it, broke it by parts. Tried to replace first the headers, and and then the code, and, and do the uh, proper adaptations from the NetBSD code, which was being based on UFS was also very similar to what we would expect to do in our regular UFS. And finally, the, the port was done in that Google Summer of Code. But the result was the performance halt. We basically lost a lot of performance. We didn't really know at that time why was all this performance lost. We did notice that we removed some of the features that the Linux implementation had, and so we blamed the pre-allocation code and because that was lost, okay? So one of the ideas was in the future, or the notes for the future maintainer was, okay, pre-allocation, we, we have to implement it back or, or do something because the performance loss is unacceptable. Uh, there were many cost, uh, coding style loops. Uh, in FreeBSD, we have the style nine. If you are going to do code in FreeBSD, you have to take that into account. You cannot just, and, and that's not something that university students learn nowadays, so, well, that's life. Um, one thing that was done that was pretty interesting is someone to try to compensate for the performance lost, uh, the code was made MP safe. And the key to, under, well, a lot of file systems were about to be removed because they were not MP safe. And the key to, um, to making X2FS MP safe was looking at the UFS code. I was not, uh, of course I was not the student or the mentor in that project. I was around, but I was around pushing the student mostly to keep the same order of the, of the code that was in UFS. So when, when, he had, when he had to look at the UFS code for making the code MP safe, we, we had all the keys from UFS where to do the locking. Okay, so that's uh, basically what we did was we looked into the history of UFS1. UFS1 has evolved a lot, of course. So we had to freeze the moment in time when the soft updates code was, was implemented and before that we started looking at how the structure was and we could basically copy and paste from one side to, to the other and check out what improvements have been done in UFS. There was an improvement in allocation it actually came from OpenBSD in UFS. They came out with some dear pref changes and they were rapidly taken by FreeBSD's UFS implementation. They, the Linux guys took note and they called it the Orlov allocator. The idea is 
it was just a pretty <coughs> small change for the huge benefits that it brought in performance. Uh, basically, you can, you can reorganize the directory structure, well, the, the space utilization structure according to the number of files in a given directory and that improves a lot of performance. Um, it's mostly empirical. It, it was changed a couple of times in UFS itself, but it was important and it was important because it was also indexed to FS. So taking it on from, from UFS was really interesting. Okay, this is a table of the results. Now, I said we lost a lot of performance. The truth is there are a lot of benchmarks out there and in some bench benchmarks it would look like the performance is uh, a lot better than on others. Okay, so the student was, uh, was particularly interested in trying to show a similar performance. And okay, you may see the violet part that is the new implementation is a little bit slower, only a little bit slower, okay? But the idea is this is with the SMP improvements. This is not the raw, the, the raw data, but, but this, this has, it has some improvement. It was acceptable enough to be committed into FreeBSD, even when, well, it was probably not very stable, but the original code was not very stable either, so, and this was BSD licensed. So this made it into the tree. Right after that, we were lucky enough that we had another student. And one of the things that I have to mention about both Google Summer of Code students involved in, in extended two FreeBSD projects is they continued working after the Google, of Summer of, the Google Summer of Code was over. And that is just simply great because they, they could just, just live with their money and, and do other things in life like normal people. Okay, there were many issues left but at least the code was clean from, the, from a license point of view. Actually, there were some, some headers that still kept GPL information and we stood a, a, a lot of time cleaning up that stuff. But basically it was clean. It's not, that licensing is always, com it's always complicated. It is, not, it is not really clear if, for example, information from headers can be really licensed or not because they're usually just numbers Numbers cannot be copyrighted. Well, but you, and nevertheless, you don't want any type of licensing problem in your code, so you just have to clean up the, the best that you can. Okay, there were in some interesting research papers related to X2FS. For some reason, Linux became very popular, and people started writing documents about how to improve the performance in X2FS. And these developments were not similar to the ones that have been historically been seen in UFS. So there was some sort of contrast that could be made. Uh, we did bring a lot of features from UFS that were, that were also implemented similarly in Linux. So they, were, they, they, they had so, sort of a high priority because that's lower hanging fruit that you can bring without much trouble. Having, having uh, the code base that is already very similar to UFS to make it look even more alike and to bring more performance improvements. So we fixed the async mode. We added odirect. Odirect is something, it actually comes from SDI's XFS. And the idea is most file systems will, will cheat on you and will catch a lot of, of the information. They will have it right there so that, well, for example, there are small files, they're easy to have in memory and uh, you don't, they, they, they can be temporary and, and probably the time it takes to write them down is a, a lot less, it's, it's a lot more than the time they are actually going to live. So you can catch them there and have them av available and, uh, and well, no one will notice, right? And, and eventually you may not even have to write them. Um, however, databases tend to like uh, to avoid all that caching. Because the idea is that some, some utilities may know better than the file system what has to be cached or not. So Odirect is a, a mode that basically disables the caching. And that was really easy to port back to X2FS. Um, the Odirect in Linux and in X2FS and in 
SDI SecTFS does a lot more things, but, but just doing this basic thing was a, a good thing to have. Okay, then Bruce Evans. Bruce Evans has been basically working on X2FS. He has been sort of a maintainer of the code. He, uh, and he had discovered quite a lot of things that were wrong in X2FS and, in the, uh, and, and doing frequent comparisons with UFS. Thing is, many of the bug fixes that he, that he found had been fixed in, UF, in UFS by alternative means, but had not been worked on in X2FS. And when the change from the GPL code to BSD license code was found, was, was made, he found a bug, a big bug that meant 50% reduction in performance, basically. Um, the student said, oh, I'll check it, but John Baldwin is here, did, did it much faster. Uh, and that, that became a huge performance improvement for us. And it's so much that, I mean, if you add the async mode and this bug fix, uh, after that we haven't really made it perform better. And we have added a lot more features, but, but it, that was a, like the highest point in performance. Uh, after much, much more cleanups and coding and stuff, I became a commuter. And that really helped bring a lot more, co a lot more of that code uh, when working with, uh, with the students. Right, because there was someone that could review it. Uh, we would basically have a, we had a small team and that worked very well. There were reviewers of the code, there were people cleaning the code, and, and basically Sheng Liu was doing most of the, of the basic coding. The project, the project was successful, but okay, it was not only, okay, we, we wanted two features basically. We wanted pre-allocation. As I said, in the previous Google Summer of Code, we knew that we had to do pre-allocation at some point because it was the main feature that we had lost and we were losing performance. And we wanted to have some extended for support. And that's basically for people, the, the extended for was basically born in those days and we needed to start bringing, uh, to, to make it easier for, for FreeBSD users to bring information from their Linux file systems. The code was not really committed that year. But, okay, here are some, some small benchmarks. As I said, there are benchmarks for everything. Uh, they will show what you want them to show, basically. Here is uh, one of number of threads versus throughput. The green, the green line was basically uh, the async mode. Okay, the idea is that uh, the student also implemented uh, window reservation window reservations, that's, uh, that's uh, I'll, I'll speak a little bit about this right now. It is somewhat like the pre-allocation code, but if you see, okay, here there is a green and a blue light, and a, and a blue line, they are basically the same. What we found is that the Windows reservation machine didn't really work very well. This performance improvement on the green and blue lines is caused by the async mode, which Traditionally, in FreeBSD is considered insecure and something that you shouldn't use. But, well, if the Linux guys do that, uh, it's sort of nice to have that mode uh, for comparison purposes. This said, we are pretty much aware that our async mode is not as fast as the <coughs> Linux async mode. Okay. Let me see. Uh, now I'm going to talk about the Linux reservation code. The idea is we lost pre-allocation, but the extended the extended two used a form of pre-allocation that the extended three removed because it was very difficult to implement journaling using that old uh, pre-allocation. But that pre-allocation did was it marked eight blocks in the, in the disk every time you would open a file for writing and leave that only for that, for that file. Uh, this, this developer, Ming Ming Kao, did basically the same as the pre-allocation in extended to, but he only did it in memory. And the reason is if you, you preserve those eight blocks in the disk, if you mark the disk that where you want to use that, that space, and you are going to try to journal, then it will be a mess. So he did it only in memory. He had a red-black tree, 
And for each node, he had a, what he called a reservation window that is the place where he's going to, to write everything. Um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll be back to this comment down. For so we did that. We implemented the windows. Actually, Sheng Liu did the implementation of the, of the pre-allocation window. And it's basically, it's basically, okay, this is the GPL code. This is the BSD licensed code. Okay, as you see, maximum value, minimum value, and, and the mid value. Um, this is the value after uh, Bruce Evans' uh, bug report was fixed. As I said, we improved the, uh, th that was an improvement to the allocation. It would set uh, the blocks more contiguously, and you see uh, the mean value went up. But probably the most important thing is that uh, this width diminished. That means the file system is a lot more predictable. If you see the, the, GNU, the GNU file system, which basically uses the same code as Linux, okay, had a huge variation. The performance overall is less, but that's probably f our fault. I mean, the, the, the Linux code does, uh, we do the same allocation, but we don't have the same, perf we have never got the same performance as, as Linux has. Uh, so the, the lower value is our fault, but this width, this huge width is their fault. That's what I think, at least. Um, okay, as I said, this is, not, this is much more predictable, but we also obviously lost performance. And then with the fix, performance went up again. And this is the result of adding the reservation window. And as you see, well, the overall performance is mostly unchanged. But the mean, the medium performance diminished a little bit. And that was something, it's in, in short, it was amazing. Because it meant either the, the student did something wrong in his code and the reservation windows are simply not working as they are expected to work, or the code was wrong. And, and we basically thought either of those could be true until I found this paper by Valeria Aurora and uh, there was also Teo Tso and some other extended two developers. The idea is they took an extended two file system and tried to res reduce the FSCK time. And if you read what they were trying to do, you say, well, they are actually doing all this stuff simply because they don't have uh, soft updates, right? They are trying to do like a, a cheaper version of soft updates. That's what they were trying to do. And in their adaptations, they removed the extended to pre-allocation because it makes pretty difficult to implement what they were doing. And they added the extended three pre-allocation. And they got to this comment, the result for the reservations only versions of X2 are even more puzzling. We suspected our port of reservations is buggy or suboptimal. And that's exactly what we found when we did the same reservations code. Uh, we think the code is buggy. I personally think, it's just my opinion, that the reservation code only worked as a caching system because of the journaling. But the, I think that the algorithm was not really very good. Okay. So what did we do? Okay, this, this is another benchmark simply. Uh, let me see, as you see, as you see, okay. Well, this is basically, this shows the improvements. Okay, this is the, the GPL file system, this is the no, this is the current file system, yeah. No. Oh, this is interesting. Okay, this was the BSD, li the first BSD licensed uh, file system. You see the performance is the lowest of them. This, the red line is the GPL file system. The performance is an average better. This is the fixed file system, the, both the violet and the blue, and with and without reservation windows, and you see that it's mostly the same. Okay, we started considering something different from the reservation windows because it was clear that that, that was not working. And the thing is the UFS code had the real lock block 
that, that fancy real log that I had talked about previously. Uh, the idea of the real log block is not really performance. The idea is to reduce fragmentation. If you see the documentation in the, in the Linux file systems, one of the ideas is, well, Unix doesn't really need to defragment. And what we found actually in that documentation is that Linux does nothing about fragmentation. Um, over in 1994, Kirk McCusick developed this realloc block. It's basically some code that uh, you, you send, you, you allocate normally like you would do uh, on your disks, the, the files, but right before writing them, this code will, will reallocate it all so it will be contiguous. And this was actually the technology that made uh, Bruce Evans' first research uh, obsolete in UFS because US Evans noticed, uh, Bruce Evans noticed that the, the, the allocation was not doing contiguous uh, allocation on the disk, right? But the reallocation would fix that. So, uh, well, he, he noticed a bug in UFS. He didn't really report it because the reallocation covered that bug and he didn't have anything left to report, okay? That bug was fixed some time ago, but it was not really all that relevant thanks to the reallocation code. Okay, and, and as I said, the idea was not really the performance, but it had that side effect that it did improve the performance, especially when the file system is aging. So uh, the extended to from match had if they have some, some code that at that time it was simply garbage for us. Uh, Sheng Liu did complete the implementation. One thing that he had to take into account is that there, was, uh, there are no, no fragments in, in Linux. So what he did was he just played with the bitmaps in Linux 2 fs and the code was much simpler, much smaller, and it worked. And we ran some, we ran some tests. Okay, so uh, we have what was current with the bug fix, and that is, uh, that is basically the, the line in the middle, right? The realloc code had some parameters that could be polished a little bit, fine-tuned, and we did get it to perform a little bit better than the, normal, than the normal implementation. But the huge advantage is aging. We can control the defragmentation to some level, and that's something that the Linux file system doesn't do and the performance is basically the, the same as we had before implementing it, so it was really worth having. It also makes our code a lot more similar between UFS and X2FS. Okay, that was really nice. Now, the status after that Google Summer of Code. The reallocation code was actually done after the Google Summer of Code, but it was one of the first things that, that, that we brought. Extended for read-only support was done. It was basically adding some more headers and, and having the disk recognize the, the, the extent structure to read it. We didn't get a reviewer. That happened some FreeBSD. We really wanted to have a reviewer. And actually, Bruce Evans said, well, I cannot review it. I don't have the time to do it. But it's new functionality. And if it's not a security risk from what it looks. Uh, so. Basically, you could bring it, but we really wanted some, I mean, if you were going to bring something to the tree and then start cleaning it up, it, it's not really nice. So what we did is we, it basically rotted in, in my disk space for a while, and then I did find a reviewer, and he made many cleanups, and it broke, and it ended up, it ended up broken. Well, I, I left it in my disk for a while. The, the other thing is when we activated realloc block, we had to we had to do something to test all this all these file system changes. You cannot just put in code that looks to work rather well. Now we had to run some benchmarks, but we also had to run some tests. So we ran FSX. It, it is on the on the tree, on the FreeBSD tree, and you can use it to test. It, it was developed actually from, from Apple. And we started finding bugs and bugs and bugs. So we did bring this code very slowly. As long as we were fix, fixing the bugs that we were detecting. And I honestly was doing most of my development in FreeBSD 9, but FreeBSD 10 was current. 
And of course, I cannot bring things directly to FreeBSD 9, so we try to keep FreeBSD 9 and 10 in sync. Uh, fortunately, X2FS is not a very common file system, so if you break it, well, we didn't break it very badly. We did break it, but thankfully, uh, not many people were using it. The feedback, though, was very useful. Okay, we proposed another Google Summer of Code 2012. It was not accepted. The idea was to add something called the directory index and journaling. Uh, but I said it was not as accepted. And, and well, we did implement a lot of, of stuff that we found very easy to get from UFS. Uh, Seek data, seek all. We added implement, uh, support for, for huge files and some other stuff that, well, I will skip right now because we, we won't have time. Um, something funny is NetBSD, we tried to keep the implementation as close to NetBSD and, and OpenBSD and UFS as we could. And NetBSD did take a Google Summer of Code in 2012 with a directory index. We were discussing with Haiku. Haiku did the directory index also. We, were, we talked with them and we got them to relicense their MIT code to BSD license. Uh, the difference is not huge, but it's, it's rather nice to have all the file system under the same license. But these guys have started all over again, and uh, we gave them some feedback about uh, where to find some stuff and how to do the hashing, uh, and the student did it, and basically uh, it appears to have worked, um, but NetBSD didn't take it. I don't know why. Okay, we discussed with them, and they were happy that we took the code, but they, didn't, they haven't included it yet. Uh, we found that this directory index, directory index is something used in many sophisticated file systems. Basically, most people do that with B-trees, but, uh, well, the, the Linux made up this, this new technology, to call it somehow, um, and they are very proud of it. And it was really nice to have it for some, one simple reason is we, we, unavoidably had to use the Linux data structures. They are in the disk, right? So if we can use their same code to provide some advantage, it's useful to have. So we brought that one, Sheng Liu did the port, and we implemented it, ported it, tested it, and it's basically working right now. Um, sadly, we have not been able to, to, to test it properly. And the reason is no one of us is really using extended to file system for something critical anymore. Um, none of us use it as a, as a main partition. Uh, we basically test it on a, on a USB. And testing on a USB, it seems just saturates the, the disk at some point and we cannot really see any advantage when using their index. Nevertheless, the code was very useful to get extended for into, into, a, into a file system. Um, well, the extended for code, we cleaned it up afterwards. It basically works. Uh, we had to work around some of the issues that it has with the newer features, because some newer features, well, uh, Linux wants, wants to have some, some newer features when mounting extended for. Uh, they, they are formatting with new options now, and, and the file system basically wants to know that it can support everything they wrote. They, they should support. So uh, it was, it is working, and but but we are only interested in keeping it read only. Okay, let me see. Let's hurry up a little bit because it's time. Okay, some uh, some thoughts about the the strategy is as I said, the thing with extended for is we don't really control the design. We have to do basically what Linux does, and it, we cannot add data structures to the to the file system. There are places where um, we added some some data structures to the to UFS, but extended to for adding the same feature didn't add the data structure, so that it had to be calculated in memory. That doesn't work very well, but it's what the Linux guys do, and we have to do it exactly equal. Okay. We considered maybe implementing soft updates, which might sound a little bit crazy, but uh, soft updates uh, actually write some, some stuff into the data structures, and but we don't own the data structure, so we cannot touch that. And, and there's a series of things that we UFS does rather well. 
Um, X2FS doesn't, X3FS doesn't, X4FS doesn't, but we cannot do either because they don't do it. Uh, okay, basically we wanted to get extended two in good shape. We were not into adding, adding a lot of performance, but we did get to a point right now where UFS1 and extended two have the same performance. Um, okay, we always kept the data headers along with upstream with extended four, and that actually makes it, uh, makes it easier to implement everything because you, we know everything the Linux guys know from the data structure, so we can take the better decisions on what code we have to implement. Um, okay, the development upstream, it went wild after X4, and the reason is X4 is dead, right? Next, the, the, the future development will be in ButterFS. So people are pushing, people are pushing very hard to get all the features they use uh, into X4FS before it dies, let's say, it, it goes into uh, dark mode. Uh, and that is a mess for us. It is a mess because there are many features that we simply are not interested in, in using in FreeBSD. Okay, this kudos to Sheng Liu. Sheng Liu started, well, he did that last uh, FreeBSD Google Summer of Code. He's now one of the biggest contributors in extended for our system. He works for a Chinese company, Beidou, the, uh, a search engine, and they use extended for a lot. And he has become uh, he has become an important contributor into the, the Linux extended for our system. And the thing is, he has continued working and developing on FreeBSD all this time. He would absolutely love to keep working on FreeBSD, but well, the reality is he has to work on Linux because it's what this company uses. Uh, about extended for read and write, as I said, I have no interest in that. Uh, the idea here is people that have their Linux file system may want to try, and that want to try for BSD will probably want to move to CFS. And the idea is that we want to make it easier for them to move their extended for partitions to CFS. Uh, we are not really interested in poster gating that, that the life of extended for uh, for them or for us. Um, I think we would welcome someone from the Linux guys. That, I mean, if someone wants, wants to provide that support, we would not reject it. Um, also, the NetBSD guys have started implementing journaling. We are not really interested in that, but if they complete that code, we will find a way to bring it to FreeBSD. We have kept the implementation similar enough that that can be done. Okay. Okay, some, some, some stuff for the future. We don't have extended attributes. They are very different from the UFS ones and it basically requires a complete implementation and I'm not sure how to identify them in FreeBSD. Access control lists, that would be interesting. You, they are based on extended attributes but uh, in theory you could understand the ACLs without uh, understanding the extended attributes. It could be done, but okay, we're not working on that anymore. Also, uh, the, the Linux file system extended for can support an almost unlimited number of directories in the file system. Uh, we haven't really worked on that and it's a complex problem because on, on FreeBSD and links is signed. Uh, on Linux it is unsigned, but they, they, also, they also find a way to break that limit uh, we haven't really looked at that. It's a rather complex problem that we're not going to look. All these features are actually used in Linux in Lustre. Lustre, the Lustre guys, they, they do clustering file systems and they added those uh, and basically contributed them back into X4. So X4 is mostly, was mostly designed by, by Lustre. And then this, we haven't really worked on that. Uh, Linux is a, uh, uh, small endian file system, uh, even on big endian platforms, it is supposed to write everything under small endian. We basically are ignoring the endianness for now. Benchmarks versus features and time testing. This is rather interesting, as I said. The, the idea, the general idea in Linux is the benchmark rules, right? And if you see those Pharonix stuff, they, they do benchmarks and they say, wow, CTFS is giving huge performance 
but it's doing something very strange because it's writing faster than my hard disk uh, controller can write. Uh, so it must be wrong. <laughs> and, and then I think, I personally think it's wrong to just look at the performance of a, of a file system. Because if, if X2, that is supposed to be the fastest file system, well, there is, it is actually the fastest file system, at least in Linux, right? Uh, doesn't take any care about checksumming and your information is corrupted, well, your benchmark will be very well, but your, your, your disk <coughs> is not. Um, another thing to consider here is uh, how do you justify spending time on extended three and even of on UFS when there is a, a, a hugely interesting file system like ZFS? Of course, there are, UFS has its own uses on, on systems that don't have those huge memories, et cetera. But one thing doesn't exclude the other. And you can form a placebo on ZFS to use X2FS that has some advantages, minimal, we would say, in that if your, your software somehow depends on, on having, on using the, the layout of the file system, like if it's a specific database, or if it's a disk specific utility that does on delete, for example, then it is useful to have X2FS in a CBO. And you get, of course, all the advantages of using ZFS. Um, another idea is, as you see, the match, the, the match OS uh, guys, what they did was they took a part of a Linux file system and plugged it into uh, UFS, basically. Uh, that could be done for other file systems. As long as they keep some similarity with UFS, I think what, what was done with X2FS could be done with, with uh, another file system. So basically, the Linux file system could be a template for, uh, our X2FS could be a template for other file systems. But that's something I'm, I haven't really looked at deeply. At least with XFS, that's not true at all. Okay, and the recommendations. Try to use, try to use uh, X2FS when formatting. Use TuneFS to add birth time because we support that fine. And you can also uh, use the dir index, which most Linux distributions are now starting to use by default. Well, that was basically it. So I have, there's uh, some minimal time for questions or comments. Questions? Okay, well, it took, it took like four years to work on X2FS and take it to the stage it is in. Uh, we didn't do it at a professional level. We're all just amateurs at this and learning our way around file systems. But well, you cannot expect everyone to pay, <laughs> right, for, for this type of thing. And it's really nice to have these things that are apparently not that important, also polished and working well on FreeBSD. Thank you.